Hello everyone and welcome back to the Virtual Pub Quiz channel. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jay and I'm the host and creator of the Virtual Pub Quiz here on YouTube, shared and watched by hundreds of thousands of people on the live shows on a Thursday and a Saturday night and all of the specialist quizzes that you see across the channel. But tonight it's not about the normal Virtual Pub Quiz Live, it's about Alzheimer's Research UK's takeover. And they're here again. Last week it was Stephen Fry and a lot of you enjoyed that very much enjoyed seeing your comments and your um your scores coming through i was playing along myself last week so it was all good fun i was able to kick back and relax and join in a quiz on my own channel which was lovely because i do enjoy a good quiz myself so it was nice to take part i got 17 out of 30 last friday night a lot of you beat me which is not surprising really as much as I write quizzes every week, it goes in that ear and out the other. But yeah, so it's all about Alzheimer's Research UK tonight. I've got to say a massive thank you to you, the community, so far. You've raised an absolute fortune for Alzheimer's Research UK at this moment in time. And they still still need help, and that's why they're back again tonight. Uh, Jonathan Ross is presenting the quiz tonight. He's got 30 questions, and he is waiting in the wings for you. But just a couple of things I just want to mention. Firstly, a big thank you to Schroeder's Personal Wealth. So they're going to match fund the first £15,000 that are donated tonight. If you remember on the live quiz we did, um, we had a match fund there and we did raise a great deal of money. So massive thank you to Schroeder's Personal Wealth for joining up with Alzheimer's Research UK and us here at the Virtual Pub Quiz to match fund the donations tonight. How do you donate? Well, the link will be down below. Uh, in the description but if you look here just under my finger at the moment it's here on the screen so all of the details you need so you've got the link there you can see which will take you direct, straight to the just giving page or you can donate as well via text so if you've got your phone to hand all the details are there when the quiz is on it will appear there uh, I've just put it there I'll put it in the bottom corner for now but it will appear about there when the quiz is on Anyway, you've had enough of me boring you to death and waffling away. You're not here for me tonight. I know Thursdays and Saturday nights are my night. You're actually here for Jonathan Ross. Firstly, we'll play a little video about Alzheimer's research and then Jonathan will be with you. I'll see you afterwards. I met my husband when I was 19 in India. To cut a long story short, I fell in love with him pretty much straight away. There were lots of evidence, but I didn't really pick it up. First one I remember really clearly is when shopping, and I said, can you pass, pass me a pack of crisps? And he struggled that, because what's crisps? And then his behavior got a bit more uh, dramatic. You know, he became more paranoid, and he kind of started changing. So I took him to doctors, and then they diagnosed at UCL and said, OK, he's got FTD, which stands for frontotemporal dementia. Your personality goes, your judgment goes. It's almost scandalous that we've known this condition for over 100 years, and yet we have no answers to that. We can't really find a cure for these masses with our research, and I think that is so critical. Vascular dementia is the second most common form of dementia after Alzheimer's disease. It's really caused by changes or damage to the blood vessels in the brain. And very often what we're calling mini strokes are happening. That's really an important message to get across because we actually know quite well how to prevent or treat stroke. And therefore we can potentially also prevent or treat vascular dementia. During my time uh, as a researcher, uh, I've seen enormous progress in how we can diagnose dementia much better, but also to understand much better what is happening actually in the brain. Even if we're not finding a cure now, research will really allow to manage the dementia much better, which in the end is a lot about quality of life that people with dementia and their families have. And if we can improve that, that's a fantastic outcome for research.
Hello everyone and good evening. And firstly, uh, welcome back to those who were here last Friday for Mr. Fry's takeover and a very warm welcome to anyone who's here for the first time. Um, tonight we're taking over Jay's channel yet again with his kind permission of course for a night of quizzing and fundraising for the fabulous Alzheimer's Research UK. Now the theme for this evening's quiz is entertainment and I'll be going through three rounds of ten questions that span the decades in film, comedy and music. I hope you have fun taking part and I hope also you'll consider making a donation to Alzheimer's Research UK. You, by which I mean the virtual pub quiz community, have already raised an incredible amount for vital dementia research. But we don't want to stop there because the charity, like so many other charities at the moment, is being hit hard by the COVID-19 crisis. Alzheimer's Research UK has predicted that income may drop by as much as 45% because of the pandemic, a huge amount. And that's why I'm here, to see if we can support them through this difficult time and provide some hope to the millions of people living with dementia around the world. Now, there are a couple of ways you can donate to Alzheimer's Research UK this evening. You'll see the donation link uh, on the screen itself, and you can also find it in the video description. And if you've got your mobile handy, and of course, if you have no cheating during the quiz, of course, but if you've got it handy, you can make a text donation from your phone by texting QUIZ10 to 70607. Uh, that will make you donate £10. So that's 70607, and that's QUIZ10 and that will appear throughout uh, the evening on your screen as well. I'd also like to say thank you to Schroeder's Personal Wealth um, because the first £15,000 of your donations will be match funded by them, which is great news. So once we hit 15000 we've actually hit 30000 uh, and so thank you uh, for that magnificent contribution to the evening. Now before we get going with tonight's question, uh, those who tuned in for Stephen's quiz last week will remember that I gate crashed at the end uh, in a rather, let's face it, feeble ploy to hope people would come back this week. Uh, and I asked a bonus question that I promised I'd reveal the answer to now. Uh, the question was, what links the actors Christopher Eccleston, Brian Cranston and Samuel L. Jackson? And the answer is that all three have fronted Alzheimer's Research UK's award-winning dementia awareness campaign, Share the Orange. Don't Google it now. You can see it online, but don't Google it now because you would be accused of cheating by your fellow quizzes. And of course, we're just about to start, but I wholeheartedly encourage you to watch those short films when you can because they're all amazing. Now, if you're ready, we're going to start the quiz. Round one this evening is film, something I like to think I know a little bit about. And here's question one. What was the full title of the 2019 Marvel Studios film that brought most of the characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe together to defeat Thanos? Okay. I'll give you that question again. What was the full title of the 2019 Marvel Studios film that brought most of the characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe together to defeat Thanos? Okay, I'm going to give you a few seconds to confer and answer that, and I'll waffle on in the background while you do. Of course, I've been a Marvel fan since when I started reading, basically, this office. I mean, now if you look behind me on the shelf, you'll see there's some... Um, that's a very rare... Uh, that's a Spider-Man. This is a Spider-Man... Uh, medallion but this is a real rarity here this is some spider-man and hulk toilet paper i don't think many of these survive for obvious reasons and it's got the whole story of a hulk and spider-man team up printed on it so you can read it while you're relaxing in your personal space so there you go you've had time to answer that good luck with that one let's move on to question number two in the World War II epic Saving Private Ryan, the fabulous uh, Spielberg-directed movie, the titular character, I always sound a bit pretentious saying that, but the title character was played by which actor? So in the World War II epic Saving Private Ryan, who played Private Ryan? Great film, of course, amazing opening sequence. Uh, probably not, I mean, uh, everyone raves about it, of course, and I think they're right to to rave about Saving Private Ryan because it is a, a magnificent piece of work with a real kind of heart to it of course um, very Hollywood in its way um, but my favourite probably my favourite and when you say favourite about a war film it's odd because you're talking about terrible kind of like human destruction and chaos but you know movies we we do enjoy seeing that kind of thing on screen perhaps because we know it's not real um, but there's a film called Beach Red starring Cornell Wilde which I very much enjoyed really kind of brutal I saw it as a kid and really shocked me I really felt the whole of war for the first time seeing Beach Red he went on Cornell Wilde was I believe an, a, an American Olympic runner gold medal winner who also starred an incredible film um, which I'm trying to remember the title of now where he runs it's called oh he, he has to escape from an African tribe that have caught him and fellow anthropologists and um, 
He basically, it's called The Naked Prey. The Naked Prey. If you haven't seen The Naked Prey by Cornell Wilde, bear in mind it's probably somewhat problematic by today's standards. But anyway, give it a watch. Okay, so that was question two. Question three coming your way now. The film Amelie is set in which country? This is an easy one, surely. This is an, someone on your team will know this. The film Amelie, lovely film, is set in which country? Um, I was hosting the uh, BBC film show when that one came out, and I remember that one of the interesting facts on little tidbits they gave us in the press pack with that was the information that in the shooting of that movie, because they had a certain feeling about how they wanted to look, it's a sort of like magical romance really, I suppose. Uh, the city they shot it in, I won't name the city, obviously that would give you the country, which is the question, but the city, they spent most of the special effects budget on the film, and there were some other special effects in it, there's a kind of an imaginary creature in it, I remember, um, but most of the special effects budget went on removing graffiti uh, in the background on the walls uh, and on the pavement in the city they shot it in that's where they spend most of the money and here's an interesting fact for you as well in Hollywood these days a lot of the time you'd be surprised how often in movies a large chunk of special effects money goes not on creating fantastical situations or world building or or dystopian futures but it goes on removing the bags under the uh, eyes and the wattle under the chin of aging leading men so when you're paying your cinema ticket, probably a pound of that is going towards making narcissists feel better about themselves. Okay, on to question four. In Finding Nemo, what is the name of the forgetful fish who got her own movie in 2016? When they wrote this question, they put who got her own sequel in 2016, but she didn't get her own sequel because she hasn't had her own first film. So in Finding Nemo, what is the name of the forgetful fish who appeared in her own movie in 2016? Finding Nemo, of course, I believe... Of that film that we're talking about, the answer to this question, the film starring the forgetful fish, and I won't name the actor who provided the voice, but uh, she's very, very popular and deservedly so in her own right. But um, I believe that film was uh, the movie that Donald Trump chooses to watch on Air Force One when he's flying around. Um, don't hold that against the film it's a charming piece of work and of course often we'll find a piece of art which is appreciated by those we might find objectionable in some ways um and i think his other favorite film or previously i remember reading that trump's favorite film of all time was blood sport starring jean-claude van damme now i like a bit of jc i like jean-claude or yeah, and you notice i went jc there for jean-claude i didn't do his initials because that's vd but i like a bit of jean-claude as much as the next person but blood sport isn't a it's not a great film. It's not even a good film, to be honest. It certainly shouldn't be anyone's favourite film. Okay, question number five coming your way now. Which world-famous film studio is located near Slough and has seen James Bond, Mary Poppins and Luke Skywalker grace its sound stages? I think pretty easy, this question as well. I think this will be the first studio you think of. But anyway, which world-famous film studio is located near Slough and has seen James Bond, Mary Poppins and Luke Skywalker grace its sound stages as many other I've been there many times I'll be honest with you, I don't really like visiting movie sets because I, you feel you, if you don't have a job to do there you know you just you're just getting in people's way and also it kind of spoils the film for you a bit I was at this particular studio when they were making the first of the Daniel Craig Burt Bond movies Casino Royale and um, there's a sequence near the end of course which is set in a uh, it's set in a uh, it's set in Venice and they had rebuilt the whole of this Venetian courtyard in this studio and then they'd also built the interiors of two massive three or four story buildings they built the whole three or four stories so they could shoot inside it including one of them which has an old style lift elevator thing which uh, is fairly key to the ending of the movie but but the whole I mean the scale of it is it's almost incomprehensible when you're there and I went there again for the one they made with uh, who was the French actor you know the guy I mean funny little guy uh, who was the villain in Quantum of Solace not a good Bond movie let's be honest I mean it has its moments uh, and I went there and they'd, feel, they'd set up his whole kind of base which is out in the desert somewhere which was amazing en enormous I mean just enormous anyway it's big but what I'm saying is the studio's big uh, question six coming up now in what year was the first Academy Award ceremony okay in what year was the first Academy Award ceremony I mean, they could have an easier uh, an easier question here would have been what decade, but you'd have probably got that. But what year? I think is pretty hard. Um, I believe it took place at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. I think that's my memory working here. I haven't checked this. 
or which I've been to, which is one of those beautiful, you know, those kind of beautiful Hollywood, that kind of early Hollywood design, where there's an awful lot of um, uh, kind of uh, decorative stonework inside, reminiscent of the uh, the building where they shot Blade Runner, of course, where Deckard has his flat, where it has that kind of like engraved walls, kind of, what's it called, sort of bas-relief type stuff. Um, but a beautiful building, great award ceremony. I've been to the Oscars a couple of times, never been in for the Oscars itself, but I've covered it for the BBC a few times and various other Channel 4 back in the day. And I'll be honest with you, I think award shows are just, it's an awful way to spend the night. Unless you're hosting them, it's an awful way to spend, even if you're winning, it's a, it's a terrible way to spend the night, it's boring. Okay, question seven, what was Walt Disney's first feature length animated film? Okay, so not his first animated film, his first feature length animated film. That question again, Walt Disney's first feature length animated film, what was its title? Uh, I don't know if you've uh, signed up for the Disney Plus channel. It's good, I think. It's worth doing. And they've got some great documentaries on there. So if you're interested in the facts behind this, I love Disney. I'm just a huge fan of Disney and what, what he created and what the company maintains and carries on doing. And um, there's a documentary on there called The Imagineers, something to do with The Imagineers, which is the name of the people who designed and crafted and built and the brilliant men and women who worked at Disney all those years ago and are still there. But interestingly, I noticed that there's a mention of an early animator who worked with Disney called Oop. I works. I think they were partners before Disney went off his own. And Ub, which is you don't. When have you have you ever met anyone called Ub? I never have. Ub uh, set up his own studio, um, and uh, it was him, I works, and someone else. And they invented a cat called Flip the Frog. And I used to have a five-disc laser disc box set of Ub I works work. But I used to show my kids. And the first time I went to Disneyland, my oldest daughter, I said, "We're in Disneyland." It's exciting, isn't it? Are you excited? And she said, yes, I love it. She said, but Dad, do you think we could go to iWorks land? And maybe in an alternative universe somewhere, Ub iWorks has his own park. I like to think so. Okay, that was that question. We're now moving on to question number eight. Question eight coming up now. Which 2020 Best Picture Academy Award nominee was based on the classic Louisa May Alcott novel? This is really as much a literature question, isn't it? Which 2020 Best Picture Academy Award nominee was based on the classic Louisa May Alcott novel. Not the first time this book has been filmed, but this is a, was an interesting version of it, messed around with the times uh, kind of flow a bit, the narrative jumps around a bit, and also uh, they do something quite interesting with the casting. Not by a long shot my favorite version of the film, but, but of the book, but not bad, certainly. Um, and there's always that thing. I think it was a Chandler quote, but it might have been Dashiell Hammett. The hardcore quizzers will know this. That someone once said to him, um, do you not despair at the the films that have been made from your books because there'd been some some stinkers as well as some good ones and apparently Chandler or Hammett or someone else I may be right off the mark here took the guest by the hand into his study and showed him the shelf with all his books and he said my books are just fine my books are still there and that's an interesting way of looking at it. I think when, when someone adapts something or when you see one of your favorite works and they don't do the job you'd hope for is the book itself still exists the book itself has not been changed by that and you shouldn't let it be changed in your head the book is still great the film is something you can either enjoy or not as you choose okay question number nine which iconic iconic american actor made one of his early film appearances in thelma and louise okay thelma and louise magnificent ridley scott one movie a uh, fabulous piece of work uh, bit of a downer at the end but which iconic American actor made one of his early film appearances in Thelma and Louise <coughs> I believe this actor no I mean he's now an Academy Award winning actor as well but uh, this actor who I've always enjoyed on screen I've always thought he was very good on screen always enjoyed his work always liked seeing him on something seems like a nice man as well I've met him socially once or twice because he was involved behind the scenes in one of the movies that my wife wrote um, but about this time, or just before this time, he came to London, I believe, and uh, had a brief liaison with Sunita. That should have been the question. Okay, and the final question for this round, round one, question number 10 of the film round is, which 1985 movie introduced us to the Truffle Shuffle and the characters Mikey Mouth, sorry, Mikey Mouth, Data and Sloth? Mikey Mouth isn't a character. So which 1985 movie introduced us to the Truffle Shuffle and to the characters of Mikey, Mouth, Data and Sloth or Sloth 
if you want to pronounce it this way. Wonderful movie, real kind of like a favourite of uh, people who identify as nerds, geeks, losers, outsiders, etc, etc. Uh, but an easy film to like and to appreciate. And one which, interestingly, stands the test of time without being problematic. I got my kids to watch Trading Places over Christmas. I thought, there's a fun film they won't have seen. Let's watch this film, which is a harmless, uh, kind of like semi-adult or sort of teen comedy, I suppose. Uh, starring the great Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd and Jamie Lee Curtis back from the uh, 80s when I was a young man and these movies, everything seemed so exciting and new and glossy and, and slightly subversive and but fun, let's watch this film together as a family and halfway through, Dan Aykroyd comes out blacked up dressed as a Rastafarian how can I justify that to my kids? the answer is I can't so you've got to be careful when you go back and watch those old movies this one, the answer to that question you're safe with I think ok so that's the end of round one I hope you're doing well so far. We now move on to round two, which is the comedy round. Okay, get your comedy hats on. Question one, which UK comedian created the character Brian Potter, owner of the Phoenix Club? Could this be any easier? Which UK comedian created the character Brian Potter, owner of the Phoenix Club? We're giving you an easy one to get into the comedy round. They're going to get tougher. Okay, uh, a brilliant comedian, of course, brilliant show that this appears in. I mean, the... The name of the show is almost in the title, in the question there, but I, I won't give it away just in case. Uh, but uh, a, a huge success uh, for him. And in a way, I think this was the first um, piece of work from him that had people take him seriously as more than just a mainstream comedian. I mean, certainly, talk from my own experience, I'd liked seeing him on TV. I, I hadn't met him when he first came out with this, but I'd liked, I'd liked his appearance on TV. I'd seen him, I think he was on some weird... Saturday or Sunday daytime entertainment show and previously this person used to be the warm-up artist for Parkinson for Parky on his uh, when his show went to ITV and BBC actually when it came back for a while anyway he was a warm-up guy but this I think I could see and I knew that he was a big fan of Ronnie Bark when I could see in this the ability that this uh, man has to write and create comedies which I think will stand the test of time so that's my waffle about him question number two which Australian comedian raised over £27 million for the Australian bushfire relief early, efforts earlier this year? What an amazing achievement. An Australian comedian, he raised over £27 million for the Australian bushfire relief efforts earlier this year. What is his name, please? It's weird. I mean, I can't imagine that would be too hard because if I were to say to you, can you name me 10 Australian comedians, I'm pretty certain none of you could do it. I know I couldn't do it. I mean, there's Paul Hogan, there's this guy, there's Yahoo Serious, I suppose. Does he count? Probably not. I genuinely can't off the top of my head. I mean, Mel Gibson has had his funny moments, but they've all been unintentional. <laughs> so, I don't know, I can't... I, but anyway, you might be struggling. Maybe I've got the wrong name in my head. Question number three... Which 1992 film starring Mike Myers started life as a sketch on the iconic US show Saturday Night Live? So which 1990, sorry, 1992 film starring Mike Myers started life as a sketch with him and of course on the iconic US show Saturday Night Live? Mike Myers, of course, I always thought Mike Myers had um, quite an English sensibility to his work and uh, I think one of the reasons of that is that he spent quite a lot of time here. I know he was a fan of British comedy and I saw him, he used to be part of a double act with um, Neil Malarkey. It was Malarkey and Myers, or Myers and Malarkey. And I saw him at the comedy store in London's Leicester Square. Uh, about, this would have been about oh, 82, 83, 84, sometime around then. Maybe 85 or 86, I don't know. Anyway, mid 80s. Uh, and they were very good. M Malarkey was always a good comedian, I thought, underrated. Myers, though, was, was, there was something about him you could see. And he had that massive confidence that Americans tend to have. You know, and at that time in British comedy, I felt like a lot of the acts you saw, they were like fumbling towards becoming what they would be uh, known for and be good at. But this guy, he hit the ground running. He was already there. He already had that confidence, had that voice. You know, he knew who he was, comedically speaking. Okay, question number four. Who co-created The Office and Extras with Ricky Gervais and later starred in his own US set comedy, Hello Ladies? Okay, who co-created The Office and Extras with Ricky Gervais and later starred in the US set comedy Hello Ladies. Um, once again, I don't think this is going to be too challenging for you, but it's nice to have some 
that make the more stupid people people playing feel like they can get some right. So I think it's it's nice. To, let's face it; it's nice to be inclusive these days. And if this isn't a question designed to encourage inclusivity, then I don't know what it is. But it's certainly not a tough one. Number five, question five: Which American TV show became famous for being, and I quote, a show about nothing? So which American TV show, obviously it's a comedy show because this is the comedy round, became famous for being a show about nothing. I think, I think there was another phrase they used to bandy around about it, which was um, no learning, uh, no, no hugging. There was something at the end they said they didn't, want, <laughs> they didn't want all of the kind of classic, somewhat off-putting cliches and tropes that one associated with American sitcoms being tagged on the end. So it was a show about nothing, you didn't learn anything, there was no warmth involved at the end. A masterpiece, of course, a masterpiece. I can't remember how many series there were, seven or eight, I think, but a masterpiece show about nothing. Okay, question number six. Who plays Send to All on their hit TV show? Who plays Send to All on their hit TV show? Uh, this is obviously a, a formatted idea on a massively popular show from a massively popular comedian, and deservedly so. Um, but it's very much a strong format idea and I've never really had a format idea on my shows which I kind of wish I did because a format idea it must be easy if you know you've got something you're definitely going to put in that the audience kind of like and they're looking forward to people kind of like uh, things that are repeated like you got this Norton's got his red chair that guy in America what's his name he does carpool karaoke James Corden has got carpool karaoke and, and even so when you sit down on the morning when you're shaping the show or the week it must be nice saying, okay, well, three quarters of the way through, we've got this. Or at the end, we've got this. Great. That's three minutes we don't have to worry about. And this is obviously a very popular idea. Works pretty well, I think. Uh, they've sent messages to me a few times, but I've always guessed immediately what it was. So I've never really been a very good subject, victim, whatever it is. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to the next question. That was question six. So inevitably, this is question seven. Which U.S. comedian was coming to America in 1988? which US comedian was coming to America in 1988? I didn't know this question was coming. I mentioned his name a bit earlier on, so there's an extra clue for you if you have any problem. This wasn't a bad movie. It wasn't a great movie. I think they, didn't they make a sequel? I think they made a sequel recently. Um, but it came at a period when he'd had a few massive hits. And I can't remember whether this was before or after another movie, which was to do with, uh, I don't want to give the title away, but a child who may or may not have been golden um, and that was a bit of a flop and there was that period where I think they just assumed that having this actor in it was going to make the movie great even if the script wasn't terrific or the direction wasn't particularly good or the, the ideas weren't solid and um, they were mistaken but anyway this was a reasonable size hit just not a great film moving on to question number eight now in Only Fools and Horses what does Trigger call Rodney instead of his real name Okay, so in Only Fools and Horses, what does Trigger call Rodney instead of his real name? Um, I am lucky enough to be able to say I was in Only Fools and Horses. I played myself. Not particularly well, actually. That's what's alarming. I didn't, I didn't really nail it. Um, but they had them going on a quiz show. And I think when the brilliant John Sullivan wrote the script, he had, he had Rodney going on who wants to be a millionaire but I think ITV because it was a BBC one show ITV for some reason as I understand it wouldn't let them use the show or the company that owned millionaire wouldn't let them use the show and they were going to have Chris Town um, but they couldn't so so um, so Sullivan came up with his version of uh, a Chris show which probably would have been successful if they put it on <coughs> and they asked me to host it and I remember with Great Shame Channel and I hadn't learned my lines. Of course, I assumed it'd be an auto prompt because I normally work on auto prompt. And um, uh, I remember da da James, uh, what's his name? David Jason being a little, a, you could see him thinking, oh, he's not really very good, is he? So not a great memory, but I'm proud to have been part of it. And it was very lovely to have been asked. And John Sullivan was a very lovely man. Question nine, and a talent, of course. Question nine. Which Hollywood actress found fame after starring in the ITV comedy drama the Darling Buds of May. Okay, Hugely popular show, first time around. I think they've just brought it back, or they're just about to bring it back. But which Hollywood actress now uh, was a UK starlet, I guess, at the time, and she found fame after starring in the ITV comedy drama The Darling Buds of May. She was also, I believe, 
around that time and she was a phenomenally beautiful young woman she was in a, a surfing movie called something like Blue Crush or Blue Juice or something which I had to review which wasn't a particularly good film but, but it was elevated somewhat by her presence in it um, she's gone on to enormous success in America and um, I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to give too much away she's one of those people I think if you don't know this already you probably do but uh, if you didn't know this already, there, it would be too easy to guess if I gave any more clues. But anyway, Darling Buds of May, the actress, she went on to find huge fame. What was her name? And this is your last question for the comedy round. Question number 10. Which US comedian and actor bought his Irresponsible tour, that was the name of the tour, Irresponsible to the O2 in 2018, and is the first comedian to sell out an NFL stadium? So a US comedian... Uh, and an actor, he bought his irresponsible tour to the O2 in London here in 2018, and he is the first comedian to sell out an NFL stadium that stands, I believe, for the National Football League. I imagine their stadiums are bigger than ours. That would be why this would be um, a noteworthy achievement. Um, I was at the, um, if you remember, there was a lot of talk back in the day about Badil and Newman, and I'm very close friends with David Badil, and I like Rob Newman a lot. I don't see him much anymore, but he's a very nice, likeable man, thoughtful man. Uh, and they were hailed at the time as these are the first British comedians to sell out Wembley Stadium. And I was at that gig. They didn't sell out Wembley Stadium. They, they sold out two thirds of it. Still an achievement. But round the back area, they had a huge big black curtain where the seats were they hadn't sold out. I'm not lying. <laughs> That's round two done. I hope the comedy category didn't cause you too many headaches. Uh, if it did, you've got a chance to redeem yourself because we still have one more round, round three coming up, which is music of the popular variety. Okay, so question number one. Who landed 2019's Christmas number one with the song I Love Sausage Rolls? Okay, so who landed 2019's Christmas number one with the song I Love Sausage Rolls? I mean, it's weird, this question, because in a way, I don't think really any of us know who's in the charts anymore. I think if you're a fan of a particular musical genre, you know who's at the top of those charts. But is there really a charts in the same way there used to be the charts? It isn't really the same, is it? There's like a download chart now. There's a grind chart. Presumably there's a country chart. Is there a pop chart? I don't know. There's a Spotify chart. Ugh. But it's all a bit weird, isn't it? It's, I'll be honest with you, I don't want to be one of those old men who say things were better back then. But things were better back then. <laughs> And we didn't have songs like I Love Sausage Rolls at number one. We had other songs. There was a Peter Sellers and Sophie Loren song about bangers and mash. That did pretty well. Okay, question number two. The song that played over the closing credits of the feature film Stardust, written by my wife, was Rule the World, which UK band wrote and performed it? I mean, we say UK band wrote and performed it. I'll do the question again first. The song that played over the closing credits of the feature film Stardust was Rule the World, which UK band wrote and performed it. Um, and what I was going to waffle on there is saying, they say UK band, but really there's one person in the band who wrote it and he performed it with the rest of the band. But to be honest with you, they needn't have been there because it was all about the song and he was singing it. So was it the, is the question really the band? Here's the thing, the question is the band. The answer will be the band because they got the credit when it was released as a single. It was by this band. But really there's one person, as is often the case, often the case. One person in the band does most of the heavy lifting. Uh, okay, so that was question number two. Question number three. Adele, we all love Adele. Adele's record-breaking albums have all been named after her age when she wrote them. So her debut was 19. She was 19 when she wrote it. Her second album was 21. Guess what? She was 21. What is her most recent album called? Okay. So Adele's record-breaking albums have all been named after the age she was when she wrote them. The debut album was 19. The second album was 21. What is her most recent album called? Uh, Adele's been in the news a lot recently, of course, because of the quite dramatic weight loss. I don't give... I was going to swear that much, shouldn't say, I don't really care that much when people lose weight or put on weight. It's none of my business. If you're happy, you're happy. You know, As long as your clothes fit. I, that's the way I feel. As long as I'm fitting my trousers, I'm perfectly happy. But, you know, I do think if you're in the public eye... I know, I know when I'm on TV, weirdly, I feel more confident when I'm not carrying as much weight because you do look slightly different. Um, and also, you don't sweat as much. And also, I'm not making this up. I was doing a talk show one night, one of my chunkier periods, and I leant back 
and due to the tightness of the clothing on the due, uh, because of the stoutness of my body at the time a button popped off my shirt right live in front of an audience that's not great for your confidence when you lean back you take a bit of <coughs> pop off it goes so good luck to her either way whatever size she chooses to stay at moving on now to question four which band has the best selling album of all time in the uk which band has the best selling album of all time in the uk okay so that's a, a big selling album but which band is responsible for it you can immediately think of the bigger bands it might not necessarily be a band that was at the top for all of their career but then again it might be in short i don't know what the answer to this is off the top of my head i haven't looked at the answers yet so i'm with you on this i'm fumbling around but the question was which band is the best selling album of all time in the uk we'll find out in a few minutes if we don't know already question number five who had a party in the usa but her father had an achy breaky heart so who had a party in the usa that's the name of one of her songs but her father had an achy breaky heart the name of one of his songs interestingly i have interviewed both the father in this question and the daughter um both very nice both very nice i got her quite early in her career uh in her solo career and previously i'll give you a little uh, hint here she's also known by another name she had fame uh, under an alias before she enjoyed success in her own right as her own person but she had massive fame as a kind of character okay number six question six now brian adams god love him brian adams still holds the record for the longest consecutive run of weeks at number one in the uk singles chart what song gave him that record okay so brian adams still holds the record for the longest consecutive run of weeks at number one in the uk singles chart but what was the title of the song uh that stayed around for let's face it a little bit longer than any of us would have cared for when I was a kid, didn't you hate that when one song was at the top of the charts for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks? Or when a song that you didn't like knocked a song you did like back down. I remember when, um, I'm pretty sure it was Heroes came out. Bowie's classic song, which has now been an anthem and is overused on commercials and sporting events and so on and so forth. And um, I believe it was just about to sneak into the top 20 when Terry Wogan, and I love Wogan, but when Terry Wogan released the floral dance and the floral dance went higher up the charts than heroes. And frankly, I took that personally as a Bowie fan. I'm a Bowie fan first and a Wogan fan second, certainly when it comes to their musical output. Uh, the floral dance didn't deserve to be heroes, did it? We all know that. Question number seven. Who recorded this year's Bond theme, No Time to Die? Who recorded this year's Bond theme, No Time to Die? Okay shouldn't be too tricky a question although you might be thinking of the bond theme for the movie that's come out already this movie has not been released yet this will be out later in the year it was due to come out in the summer they pushed it back due to the awful pandemic that we're all making our way through um but interestingly normally the bond movies used to come out in like november anyway i don't know why they moved it to summer this year but previously bond movies always would come out around mid-november uh, and I know this is a fact because quite a few of them came out on or near my birthday and I used to kind of think it was like the universe's gift to me I'd go to a Bond premiere you know the week I turned another year older just me being self-centered uh, number eight who won the X Factor in 2006 and went on to have a massive global hit with Bleeding Love okay so cast your mind back to 2006 who was the winner that year of the X Factor? And this performer went on to have a massive global hit with Bleeding Love, which of course isn't always um, a guarantee that the winner will go on to have a hit or indeed a career after winning it. Often it's the runner-up that does better. Um, but this person did go on to have a huge hit. And this person, I'm trying to avoid using a set, I just said her, but I was trying to avoid giving you that clue. This person, uh, she, it's a woman. It's a woman, okay? I've, if I've made it too easy for you, I apologise. What can I do? I'm doing it for charity. Come on. Okay. Question number nine. UK singer David Robert Jones was better known by what stage name? UK singer David Robert Jones was better known by what 
stage name. It's interesting because that that birth name or the name given by his parent, David Robert Jones, couldn't be more mainstream and straightforwardly dull, could it? I mean, it would have been, I would have loved it if he was called Colin or Barry, that would have been great. But David, David's a kind of very unthreatening, really may lower middle class name. Robert, oh Robert, very middle class name, very bland. You expect someone just to go on to have a life of quiet inconsequence. And Jones, Jones is like the joke name. You'd, you'd either reach for Smith or Jones if you want the most kind of like common names in the world. So he was there and he went on to become someone who was anything but straightforward. Okay, by the way, no uh, offence meant to people called David or Robert or Jones, but I think you'd have to agree with me. And last, but by no means least, question number 10. In the 1964 Beatles song, what did they want to do that would currently be frowned upon during social distancing? In the 1964 Beatles song, what did they want to do that would currently be frowned upon during social distancing? I'll give you a clue here. It isn't, I want to cough in your face. It isn't, I want to sunbathe with you. It isn't, I want to jog past you too close to, on the pavement. It's none of those things, all of which would quite widely be frowned upon right now. It was something else that they wanted to do back in 1964. It's quite sweet, quite a charming thing, really. Um, it's not, I want to spit on you, wasn't that? No, no. It, you know. But it's interesting, isn't it, in this pandemic, you know, the fact that we're looking at those things now. We are slightly more, I'm more cautious about touching people and um, uh, the fact that we are who would have thought that the big challenge facing most of us during this kind of uh, end of the world type scenario that we see in movies all the time even though hopefully it isn't the end of the world it would be the difficulty in getting uh, a supermarket delivery slot that's the big challenge that most of us have faced okay so that's your three rounds for the evening we'll go through the answer shortly but before we do i would like to introduce a short video i hope you'll uh, watch this please it's clear of course that alzheimer's research uk is a charity that means so much to many of you. We know that, that's why you're taking part, that's why you're donating, we thank you so much. And this film highlights just why the work of the charity is so important. So unashamedly, I'm asking you directly, once again, if you can, if you haven't already, please do make a donation to the charity tonight. Every penny you give will make a huge difference. And don't forget, Schroeder's personal wealth will match fund the first £15,000 of donations we raise. So let's hope we at least get to £15,000 because that's double to 30 and that'll mean your donation will go even further. So please watch this. Hi, I'm Hayley and I'd like to talk to you about my dad, Michael. I'm always so proud to tell people that dad was a fireman and he absolutely loved his job. Physical fitness was always important to Dad. He was always on the go and he loved playing football. He had a wicked sense of humour. He was a fantastic artist and his friends and family meant the whole world to him. We first realised that Dad was unwell when he began repeating himself a lot and everyday tasks such as cooking or driving had become quite confusing to him. Dad was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's at the age of 58 and as a family nothing could have prepared us for the brutality of this disease. Dad experienced symptoms such as hallucinations, seizures, incontinence, loss of speech and eventually he forgot how to read, write and walk. Just a few weeks ago Dad was admitted to hospital because his Alzheimer's had caused him to forget how to swallow and food trapped in his airway had infected his lungs. He passed away four days later at the age of 62. Dad volunteered to take part in several Alzheimer's Research UK studies and he supported this charity because not only are they dedicated to finding a cure for Alzheimer's, but they are also searching for ways in which to prevent dementia entirely. So whether your lives have been affected by dementia or not, please consider giving anything you can to this amazing charity because to the 850,000 plus people in the UK alone who are living with Alzheimer's disease, there could be no worthier cause to them or their families than the prospect of a world without dementia. Thank you so much.
A big thank you to everyone who has shared their stories this evening and helped raise awareness of dementia in support of Alzheimer's Research UK. Now, if you need a bit more time to consider your answers, uh, if you want to nip to the loo, if you want to refill your drink, please do feel free to pause because obviously you've got your answers in so that we're not worried about anyone cheating or misbehaving. Otherwise, let's move on and start with the answers to round one. Here we go. Question one was... What was the full title of the 2019 Marvel film that brought most of the characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe together to defeat Thanos? And the answer was Avengers Endgame. Of course it was. Avengers Endgame. And it was quite a magnificent achievement in its own way. Uh, filled with plot holes, but still great. In the World War... This is question number two now. In the World War II uh, epic Saving Private Ryan, the titular character was played by which actor? And it was... That's right, Matt Damon. Pat yourselves on the back if you've got Matt Damon. Or Matt Damon, as they say in that uh, wonderful... <laughs> what's that film they say that in? It's the one with the puppets. Anyway, Matt Damon. Number three. The film Amelie was set in which country? And the answer was France. Mainly it's in Paris, France, but it's in France. Uh, so Amelie was set in France. Well done if you got that right. Question four. In Finding Nemo, what's the name of the forgetful fish who got her own movie in 2016? And the answer you were looking for is Dory. It was Dory. Which world-famous film studio is located near Slough? This is question five. And has James Bond, Mary Poppins and Luke Skywalker as visitors? That is, of course, Pinewood Studio. The legendary Pinewood Studio. Uh, still going strong. And they make a lot of TV there these days as well. Number six. In what year was the first Academy Awards ceremony? It was 1929. Well done if you got that. It's a tough one. I think I would have got 20s, but I don't think I could have put my finger on 29 correctly number seven what was Walt Disney's first feature length animated film and it was of course Snow White and the Seven Wolves everyone thought he was crazy no one thought people would sit still and watch a movie that was pure animation for that long uh, many people believed that just watching a, uh, an animated movie over now like would give you massive headaches for some reason they thought the colours and the moving images would disturb people how wrong they were how wrong they were how we laugh at them today question eight which 2020 Best Picture Academy Award nominee was based on the classic Louisa May Alcott novel? The answer is, of course, Little Women. Little Women, as I said, not I don't think it was the best version of it, but it wasn't bad. It was interesting. Number nine. Which iconic American actor made one of his early film appearances in Thelma and Louise? I'm pretty sure you got this. It's Brad Pitt. It's Brad Pitt looking amazing as only Brad Pitt can. Although, if you saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he still looks pretty good. For his age, he looks great. And number 10, question number 10 in the film round. Which 1985 movie introduced us to the Truffle Shuffle and the characters of Mikey, Mouth, Data and Sloth? It was, of course, The Goonies. It was The Goonies. There you go. You've got that, I'm pretty sure. Okay, let's move on to round two's answers. For question one, we want you to know which UK comedian created the character Brian Potter, owner of the Phoenix Club, and that was Peter Kay. Of course, it was the brilliant Peter Kay. Now riding high with car share, but Peter Kay, of course, uh, created Phoenix Knights and Brian Potter. Question two, which Australian comedian raised over 27 million for the Australian bushfire relief efforts earlier this year? It was Celeste Barber. Okay, I had no idea. The only one I could think of was um, Adam from The Last Leg. I had no idea it was Celeste Barber. I'll be honest with you, I, I've never even heard of Celeste Barber. Well done, Celeste Barber. Congratulations, you're a lovely person. Number three, which 1992 film starring Mike Myers started life as a sketch on the iconic US show Saturday Night Live? It was, of course, Wayne's World. Wayne's World, amazing. Him and Dana Carvey sitting on the couch. What an amazing film. Wonderful. I think directed by Penelope Spheris. Good movie. The answer for question number four, who co-created The Office and Extras with Ricky Gervais and later went on to star in his own sitcom, Hello Ladies, was, of course, that giant among comedians, Stephen Merchant. That's question four's answer, Stephen Merchant. Question five, which American TV show became famous for being a show about nothing? That was, of course, Seinfeld. The amazing Seinfeld. What a show, what a series, what a comedian. Question six, who plays Send to All on their hit TV show? I'm pretty sure you've got this right, but it is, of course, Michael McIntyre. He does Send to All. He takes someone's phone and they send a silly message to everyone and see what sponsors they get. Number seven, the U.S. comedian coming to America, uh, sorry, the U.S. comedian who was coming to America in 1988 was Eddie Murphy. As you know, earlier I was dissing uh, Trading Places. He was in that as well, but it was coming to America. It was Eddie Murphy. 
Question eight in only fools and horses. What does Trigger call Rodney instead of his real name? He called him Dave. He called him Dave. You might have been mistaken there. You might have put you plonkers or something like that. No, he called him Dave. Number nine. Which Hollywood actress found fame after starring in the ITV comedy drama The Darling Buds of May? It was, of course, Catherine Zita Jones. Catherine Zita Jones, who went on to win an Oscar for Chicago and then said, Oggy, 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 Oi, 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 which is probably the first time anyone said that on stage at the Oscars. And finally, the answer to number 10 Which US comedian actor brought his irresponsible tour to the O2 in 2018? He was also the first comedian to sell out an NFL stadium. It was that pocket rocket of comedy himself, Mr. Kevin Hart. Okay, Kevin Hart. So that's all your questions. And last but not least, here are the answers to round three. Coming at you now. Question one, I asked you who landed 2019's Christmas number one song with the, the, with the hit I Love Sausage Rolls. And it was Lad Baby. Lad Baby. I'm glad I didn't know that, to be honest with you. I feel happier and cleaner that I didn't know that. Lad Baby. Question two, the UK band that wrote and performed Rule the World, which played over the end credits to Stardust, was... Take that. Of course, when I was waffling earlier about it being one person, it's Gary Barlow, really, but take that. Number three, Adele's most recent album is called 25. You got that? We still went for the new one. Let's hope it isn't called 47 or something. It's been quite a long wait. Question four, which band has the best-selling album of all time in the UK? Here you go. This is a bit of a sneaky question, to be honest with you, because it was Queen with their greatest hits. Now... The pedants among you, and I would consider myself one as well, would say a Greatest Hits album doesn't count as an album, really. It's not a legit album. It's a compilation of other albums, the high points of other albums. But still, it was the biggest selling one of their full-length releases. So that's why we've gone with that. The Queen's Greatest Hits. I'm sure many of you will be furious, furious at that answer. Question five, who had a party in the USA while her poor father suffered from an achy, breaky heart? And the answer is Miley Cyrus. Little Miley Cyrus. She was Hannah Montana when I first met her. And then she emerged from that cocoon to be a star and as Miley Cyrus. Question six, I asked Brian Adams. Still holds the record for the longest consecutive one of weeks at number one in the UK singles chart. What song was it? And the song was, Everything I Do, I Do It For You. Everything I Do... I do it for you. Number seven. Who recorded this year's Bond theme, No Time to Die? It was Billie Eilish. Little Billie Eilish, who seems quite shy and introverted and wears baggy clothes, but sings some brilliant stuff and writes with her brother, Billie Eilish. Question eight. Who won the X Factor in 2006 and had a massive global hit with Bleeding Love? That's right, it was Leona Lewis. Well done if you got that. Number nine. The UK singer David Robert Jones was better known by what stage name? Of course, that stage name is David Bowie or Bowie. I'm trying to remember whether it's Bowie or Bowie. Bowie, Zowie, Zoe, Zowie. It's Bowie, David Bowie, because Zowie Bowie was what Duncan Jones' name was. David Bowie. But I always grew up calling him David Bowie, but that was incorrect. However, you'll be pleased to know he didn't care whether you called him Bowie or Bowie. I asked him. He didn't care. And finally, number 10 in the 1964 Beatles song, What Did They Want To Do That Would Currently Be Frowned Upon During Social Distancing? The answer is, hold your hand. You can hold the hand of someone you're self-isolating with, or you can hold your own hand, but you can't hold someone's hand if you haven't been in isolation with them at the moment. Still, I believe. Although, who knows, because the government's been pretty vague. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a wrap for tonight's quiz. It's been great fun. I've enjoyed doing it. I hope my waffling hasn't annoyed you too much. And regardless of your scores this evening, I hope you had a good time. If you have made a donation tonight, thank you. You can bask in knowledge. You've helped a really worthy cause. If you haven't donated yet, there is, of course, still time. And I know Alzheimer's Research UK really will be grateful for every penny they receive, and it will be very well spent. Your host for next Friday will be revealed soon, so do keep an eye on Alzheimer's Research UK and the virtual pub quizzes social channels for an announcement. It will be the same time, 8.15pm, and the same place next Friday. I'm about to sneeze. Good timing. Thanks again for having me. Now back to you, Jay. Good night, everybody.
Cheers, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Oh, I'll take that headphone out now. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Jonathan, for a great quiz. I think I got 13 out of 30, which is um, not, a, not a good attempt. But yeah, let us know how you got on, as usual, uh, across our social media links. Alex will be standing by, and myself across Facebook and what have you, to share some of those scores out. Um, we always love, as you know, to share the scores out, especially on the live quizzes. So yeah, let us know how you got on. Uh, yeah, 13 out of 30. thought I might have done a bit better than that. But uh, anyway, um, the donation link is still here. There it is, just there. Um, so that will still be up there. We'll update you over the weekend across our social media platforms as to uh, how much was raised through the quiz tonight and over the weekend. So we'll keep you updated with that. Um, but Jonathan was slightly wrong there about keep an eye on our social media platforms. Um, because I know who next Thursday night is, uh, next or next Thursday night, next Friday night's final host for Alzheimer's Research UK's takeovers are. I know who it is. You can call her a queen, well, she can actually call herself really a queen of the jungle in her own right. I think we should say hello. Evening all, Scarlet Moffat here. I'm so sorry for gate crashing Jonathan's quiz, but I wanted to let you know that I will be your takeover host next Friday night in support of Alzheimer's Research UK. I've got some really fun rounds planned to help raise even more money for this fantastic charity, which is very, very close to my heart as I lost both of my grandmas to dementia. And because it's Alzheimer's Research UK's final takeover quiz, it's only right that we go out in style. To help make that happen, the lovely Iceland Foods Charitable Foundation, who are long-term supporters of the charity, have offered to match fund the first £20,000 of donations, which is amazing news. So do join me back here next Friday, the 5th of June, from 8.15pm. I'll see you all then. Thank you very much, Scarlett. Looking forward to that. Is it wrong? I want I want to find out where she got her Pac-Man from that was in the background. That was quite smart, that. That might look quite good up sort of up there somewhere. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Scarlett. Looking forward to that for next Friday. So thank you very much for getting involved with us here at the Virtual Pub Quiz and Alzheimer's Research UK. That's it for tonight. Thank you very much, as always, for your donations and your support. Uh, the link's still down below, and it's that way. Mm, too far. Uh, there we go. Uh, so the link's still there um, if you haven't had a chance to donate. Thank you again, as always, um, for your donations to this, to this very great cause. Uh, other than that, that's it from me. Um, so Scarlett will be back with you uh, with the takeover on next Friday. I'm back on Saturday night with the Virtual Pub Quiz Live, as always, and then back live with next Thursday night and the specialist quizzes that you'll see, all sorts going on. If you're new around here, drop uh, if you hit subscribe, you'll get a notification for next week, so you'll be notified when uh, when. Scarlet goes on with the quiz next week and obviously all of the other quizzes and stuff that we've got going on um, it'd be great to see you on there thank you very much as always we'll see you soon take care and as always stay safe